and a very happy International Mountain Day to you all. At Isimod, we celebrate several international days, including World Water Day, International Day for Biological Diversity, World Environment Day, and the International Women's Day. These are all important to us as they represent issues that we're all, that we are deeply engaged in. However, probably the one closest to us, of course, is International Mountain Day, which is, of course, today. It started in 2002, when the UN declared the International Year for the Mountains on the 11th of December, has served as a day dedicated to raise awareness and discuss mountain-specific issues. Other than being home to millions of people worldwide, mountains are also home to one quarter of all land animals, and plants on the planet. Mountains provide fresh water to half of the world's population. Many of the world's most important crops and livestock species also originate in mountain regions and are a source of food and medicine for millions of people. At the same time, mountain people are among the poorest, most food, water, and energy insecure people in the world. And now with climate change, mountain people, our biodiversity and environments are becoming highly exposed to multiple risks and heightened vulnerability. For us as, at Isimod, IMD is a day to generate greater awareness of the importance of the Hindukush Himalaya for the region and for the planet. It is a day for us to reflect and deliberate on what the mountains mean to us all and to also discuss the theme for the year. This year's theme is sustainable mountain tourism. Mountain tourism is a cornerstone of mountain economies, especially in our region. Many mountain communities depend on tourism for their livelihoods and to supplement their incomes. Tourism has also helped many living in the mountains to break out of poverty and improve their socioeconomic conditions. But as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has severely impacted tourism in our mountains and of course in many other regions of the world and halted if not reversed some of the positive gains for many communities. This is why today we wanted to touch on some of these issues as we start discussing what sustainable mountain tourism in the HKH should look like as we move towards a post-pandemic recovery in our region. While tourism has been a boon for our mountains, it did also bring about its own ills, especially in terms of negative impacts on the environment. For example, the issue of overcrowding in tourism hotspots, poor waste manage management, uncontrolled and unregulated construction in fra fragile areas. I think we all know the famous picture that was taken of the queue up Everest. This year's theme therefore allows us the opportunity to re-envision and rethink what mountain tourism of tomorrow should look like. The pandemic in some sense has also given us an opportunity to redo some of the things we did wrong in the past, a chance to recover in a more sustainable and more inclusive manner such that we minimize the negative impacts when we start again. Sustainable tourism in mountains, if we can get it right and deliver the right incentives to make it work, can contribute to creating additional and alternative livelihood options and promote poverty alleviation, social inclusion, as well as landscape and biodiversity conservation. 
So International Mountain Day is also the occasion when we announce the winners of the annual Mountain Prize. Over the years, we have awarded this prize to outstanding individuals and organizations from our region who have championed a certain cause or contributed significantly to the mountains and mountain people. Starting this year, we have decided to rename our Isimod Mountain Prize to the Dr. Andreas Schild Memorial Mountain Prize in honor of our late Director General, Dr. Andreas Schild, who passed away recently. For anyone who remembers Andreas or had the pleasure to work with him, he truly was a champion for our mountains. His dedication and legacy continues to live on in many parts of the HKH region. And for us as an institution too, Andreas Schild played a significant role in shaping Isimod into the organization that it is today. The theme for this year's Mountain Prize is, is COVID-19 response and contributions towards building resilience of HKH communities. I look forward to finding out who the outstanding organization and individual are for this year and learning more about them. Lastly, thank you for taking the time to join us today. I am excited to hear from our distinguished guests and the panel discussion that we have put together. Once again, happy International Mountain Day and thank you. Thank you, Isabella, for your welcome remarks. Now I have the pleasure to invite a very special guest who has been, we're, we're really lucky to have him here today. Um, someone who needs no introduction, uh, someone from our region and well-known. So very much looking forward to uh, the keynote address from Sunam Manchuk, sir. Or to you, sir. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Happy once again to be here in Kathmandu and at Isimod, uh, connecting to not only the mountains of Nepal, but also eight countries. Um, and I want to wish you all happy uh, International Day of the Mountains. We are more connected than ever, uh, thanks to your efforts and working towards celebrating the mountains and solving the challenges that the people face in these mountains. And in this regard, we feel connected now uh, even more than before as a member of the HUC and uh, uh, carrying forward studies, for example, in cryosphere studies um, together with Kashmir University. And uh, generally, I find it really uh, a great platform that ISI mode provides for us all to learn from each other, share our you know, challenges and innovate and find solutions. I've always been saying, that mountain people will have to find solutions to their own challenges uh, with their own young people through their education system. We cannot expect people from New Delhi or New York to come and solve our problems. We are very special in that way. I sometimes find that we are as close as it gets to outer space or another planet. Uh, really compared to the big cities of the world. So our challenges are different and the attention they need is very different from the rest of the planet Earth. Um, now, Himalayan Institute of Alternatives that I represent uh, and was uh, engaged in the founding of, which is what I was speaking about when I talked about the collaboration with this mode, we in the mountains of Ladakh 
trans Himalayan mountains of Ladakh, try to do exactly what I talked about to find solutions to um, living life in these uh, extraordinary environment and uh, climate, facing the challenges thrown at us, often for no fault of ours, like climate change, of which we are the early victims. We hope to engage young people from Ladakh and the neighboring mountains of the Himalayas and other mountains of the world to find such solutions, whether it is about adapting to climate change through water solutions for farmers with innovations like the artificial ice stupas or baby glaciers, I would say, or greening the devastated uh, valleys hit by flash floods, healing them to recover and absorb the more increasing rainfalls that we see. As you know, precipitation is becoming more and more erratic. Um, you don't have enough when you really need, and then you have downpours and flash floods when you don't, and we'll have to adapt to them by recovering the, the um, absorptive capacities of our valleys, which have been denuded and washed away because of these flash, flash floods. So we have programs to heal these high valleys. Similarly, solutions around water and new techniques of farming, adapting to the shortage of water that we face now more and more and supplementing the degraded income from farming with sustainable ecotourism, which happens to be the theme of this year. Tourism can be a great boon, especially when farmers are anyway struggling in these mountains with water challenges. To give just a small example, there's one little village near Leh called Kulum. 12 years ago, the people had to abandon the village because after a flash flood, the water system was completely derailed and they could not sustain their farming uh, in this village, very tiny village of some 12 households, but they had to completely abandon. And for the last two years, we have been working on making small artificial glaciers, since they don't have other glaciers anymore, to enhance, but still it is not enough to bring back uh, their farming as before, or even if we could, perhaps it's not enough to sustain or interest the younger generation um, as it might have done their parents. So what we are doing is um, increasing as much as possible the supply side of water by intervening with artificial glaciers and so on. But at the same time, the demand side also by introducing techniques like drip irrigation and crops that need even less water. And add to that, these two have to go hand in hand, but add to that then to make it into a story of revival, a story of people coming back to their abandoned village, a story of hope where, um, you know, with innovation and people's own efforts, they are able to come back after 12 years. That's the story we want to create. And as they slowly come back, it could be made interesting for visitors to come and stay in the village and experience this rehabilitated village. So generating a story of hope and tourism is all about stories. And then when they have their, um, we call them farm stays, where people 
experience the life of the village and not just spend a night to go somewhere else where the place you sleep is the destination in itself. So farm stays added to innovation, makes the income enough to attract the next generation. This we started two or three years ago. And uh, this year we were very um, happy to see that with the first ones who had faith in rehabilitation, others didn't even believe us. They planted potatoes again, and the first three families produced some 1300 kilograms of potatoes in a completely abandoned village, which had uh, no life for like 12 years. So now with sustainable ecotourism added to it, we hope that it will become an example for other villages who might go their way. And uh, where we are, the alternative university, we came to this village to establish our university, seeing their water challenges. But then we saw that water is not the only problem. With changing times, young people abandon their villages anyway. So maybe you have enough water, still the youth would go. And to attract the youth, you want to bring back life into the villages. Life as you would find in a city could be brought back to the villages. So tourism is a beautiful way of removing this loneliness of the younger generation you know, in high Himalayan villages. When people from around the world come and you know, engage in exchanges, it becomes interesting in the villages without having to go through the problems of uh, urban uh, settlements and uh, economy rather than you know young people leaving the village and going to the cities thereby co causing a collapse or implosion i often call of the villages and an explosion of the cities that's what is happening in Ladakh also, has been happening. Implosion of villages because the youth are all going to the capital city lay and explosion of the city. So both are dying. And one very good way we have believed and we are now seeing is to bring back life in the village, make it so interesting that young people don't want to leave anymore. They have company, from around the world and they have income at their doorsteps rather than them leaving for incomes, the income comes to their doorsteps, whether it is rents for the room or products that they buy from the neighbors to serve in the farm stays, milk, handicrafts, you know, vegetables. So the whole village benefits in such a system. So this is why uh, we have made sustainable tourism a major part of our alternative university among the first few schools. Sustainable tourism actually started before the university started. We started with an intervention in the village so that we could help the people in the village and start something that interests them and that helps their young people. And then we started the university on a desert. The joke happens to be for us that this village, which was neglected by the young people who left their large houses to move to the city, which is not very far away also, but as the old parents um, die, they would leave to the city and big buildings would be free lying vacant. And we took one of these as the starting point of our alternative university and started this Himalayan farm stays project as the precursor to the Himalayan Institute of Alternatives. Within one and a half year, the interest of people in their farm stays had become so high that we couldn't afford the building that we 
lodged ourselves in. So we had to vacate because it was so interesting for them to keep tourists. And we happily uh, were unable to afford the same house because within a year or two, everybody wanted to do this. So I have a short film that we made at the time, and I'll then share with you how it can be adapted and actually, you know, by leaps and bounds um, evolve to respond to a situation like COVID-19. How we can make an opportunity of the situation. Sad it is, but then for the mountain villages, maybe this could be an answer, an opportunity also. So maybe we can have that uh, little video just for you to get an idea of what kind of place I'm talking about, because Ladakh is very different from most places, but then Himal or Trans-Himalayan Nepal, you would find many uh, similarities. The farm stay, so I was very a little bit very hesitant initially, but when I went there, so the rooms were big.
This was made some three years ago to promote these farm stays. Um, at the Himalayan Institute of Alternatives, um, apart from farm stays and uh, ecological interventions to heal the valleys, glacial valleys, we also work with um, solar passive shelters and homes, whereby we take from our ancestral wisdom, the art of building mud buildings, earth buildings. Again, earth is something that is natural material. You find in plenty right under your feet, rich or poor, there's nobody so poor that you cannot afford soil under your feet. So we're using this material, and that's not our invention, that's our ancestral wisdom all across Himalayas, in Bhutan and Arunachal to Skardu and most places of the world actually, but we haven't yet lost it completely. So we are trying to bring it back and add to it what our ancestors didn't have. And that is solar heating, the thermodynamics of heat signs uh, of the sun because they didn't have glass. So you couldn't expect them to have solved this, but with the new developments, um, we, in our school of uh, energy and sustainable habitats, have been working on buildings that do not need any heating, absolutely anything, uh, even in Ladakhi winters. The building that I live in uh, these days, when it was minus 10, 12, was always above plus 22. And whole of last year, uh, it was. 90% of the times between 18 and 25 degrees, which is much warmer than a place like Delhi. And I always say when I pass by Delhi, I feel cold coming from Ladakh, which normally is associated with cold weather. And now we're offering it to the military, which is a huge guzzler of energy and emitter of uh, CO2, not just in India, on the other side in China as much, and Pakistan, several of these um, countries have their huge military presence in the high mountains, which are so cold, and people there come from the warm parts on all the sides, and so much is used to heat their shelters. I was making a rough calculation, you might do a study actually at this mode together maybe, roughly half a million um, soldiers are positioned in this stretch um, from Pakistan to the eastern end of India and uh, from the three countries and roughly a million ton of CO2 is emitted just to keep them warm, just to keep them warm. So the Indian army, I must give it to their credit, has taken it up in a very serious way together with our institute to solarize their shelters and rid themselves of this emission and uh, drain off the national exchequer for dollar reserves uh, since it comes from the Arab countries. Um, we have built prototypes already, bang on the borders, Tibet uh, and Ladakh, um, which are doing quite fine and they hope to scale it up. And I wish and pray that all the sites, you know, they're all human beings. So they should all avail of these technologies uh, and the outcome will be much uh, reduced CO2 emissions from all these otherwise not so friendly countries, but these are things that we should share and um, rid ourselves of pollution, not just emission for greenhouse gases, but this is also the most uh, fragile place where unburned soot or carbon, black carbon causes further melting of glaciers as they sit on the white glaciers, reducing its albedo or reflectivity. Um, apart from that, for the local population, we have been promoting this. Now I'm connecting 
when you connect this school of passive solar heated um, housing with the school of sustainable tourism, then you have something even more interesting. Then the problem of tourism in our region is that it is concentrated in very toxic doses. For example, in Ladakh, in three months, roughly 300,000 tourists descend on three square kilometers, which is Lay City. So you can imagine how toxic it can be. So many tourists in just this small. So we need to expand it in space and in time. In space, going from urban to rural areas, like I mentioned. And in time, from summer three months to whole year, winter, spring, autumn. And what keeps them from doing that is the temperatures. And this school comes in handy to provide solar passive mud buildings with ancient traditional architecture, make beautiful buildings that are very popular among tourists. So you can use interventions and innovations like this to not only introduce uh, sustainable tourism, but also to prolong it throughout the year so that it becomes a reliable income source for the people. They don't look at it as a seasonal thing and not take it seriously, which is what has been the case there. Now we're trying to go into winter tourism. As I speak, we are planning for a winter New Year Losar festival tourism uh, intervention in this village of Pyang and Ladakh generally. So these are possibilities that we have been exploring. Now comes COVID. So when COVID came, people became, people lost hope that this alternative is not really an alternative. We might be doomed, uh, even though we saw a lot of hope is what perhaps the villagers, like all hoteliers and travel related uh, entities thought. But for the mountains, and especially for the mountains, not just Ladakh, all over, we have been exploring, observing and exploring something new that might be of interest to you all also. With the lockdowns and the new COVID scenario, A, people want to get away. B, it has made us used to working from a distance. For most jobs, but particularly software related jobs can be done from anywhere. In fact, almost all of us saw the potential of um, distance working. For me, it has actually been a great relief that I didn't have to travel three times a month. It has become less than once a month. So similarly, so many professions, so many jobs can be done from a distance and particularly software, which is a strength of the subcontinent and can become a strength uh, of the, a bigger area of the subcontinent. What we saw was that people were looking for places to go to live and work from, not just as a tourist for a week, but what they have started calling vocations, workations, not just vocations, but workations. So we have been exploring together with our partners to prepare homes in villages for long-term stays by people who are stuck in metros like Bombay and Bangalore and Delhi and maybe Dhaka and you know, Karachi and Islamabad and so on to get an escape and work from such pleasant places that are safe and are cool when they are very hot in these cities. And the results are very interesting. There's a lot of interest among people to take vocations and they are long-term, they are for months. To the extent that we are thinking of making it into a scaled up 
uh, economy in many villages of Ladakh. We might be taking up with some of the big software companies because we saw that it could be a double expense for these software engineers to keep their Bangalore homes empty and pay for something in Ladakh. So we are even exploring, for example, Infosys is a large Indian software company. They have roughly two and a half hundred thousand, two and a half lakh professionals uh, around Bangalore. And they provide um, accommodation to all of them. Maybe now that the COVID might go, we can't make solutions that uh, are nowhere once we return to normal, but maybe this uh, new way of life of working from any place and any even more pleasant place can become an opportunity. So maybe the trend of people coming to cool and clean Himalayan villages to work from stays on beyond COVID. So we are planning to explore with companies like them to say that if you have two and a half uh, lakh people to cater accommodation to, maybe you could keep a two third of that in the city and a one third could be developed in these, in these mountains so that your employees could have a rotation of some kind and it's a part of their deal and it's looked up to as an interesting feature of their work life to be able to go to the mountains in the summers definitely and even winters are becoming so attractive when you have warm solar heated houses cold is a romance with nature you, know? you can you can look at it that way also so we are hoping that we can make it into an opportunity by exploring at a higher scale with such companies which will have as a regular part, part of their um, employees going for a month or two in these places and working from there. Now the catch there is of internet. You have to have absolute, uh, you know, highways. Um, nothing less will work. And for that, our school of innovation, which is just at a nascent uh, stage as a school, we are exploring a new technology where mountains are not an um, impediment, are a strength. So there's a new technology some of you may have heard called LiFi, light-based internet um, transmission. Right now, internet signals are transmitted by radio waves. They are very inefficient, very power guzzling. And I've always asked these telecom companies, why do you put your towers by the roadside? When you're in the mountains like Ladakh, why don't you put one tower on a hilltop and cover 10 of your current towers? But they would say, um, we can't do because it takes seven kilowatts of power, a generator, and a man to operate those. And we can't do it where roads can't reach. We cannot take those generators on mountaintop. Then enter this new technology, which we are collaborating with a company that is innovating in Li-Fi technology in Gujarat. Together, we are hoping to develop a system where the light-based internet needs 50 watt instead of 7,000 watts, okay? So it is so efficient that it needs only 50 watt. 50 watt means a panel of this size and a battery, which can be easily carried up to mountain tops and can transmit not small radio wave uh, based uh, towers can only transmit some 100 Mbps or so light based can do one gigabyte per second, GBPS. So it's like optical fiber, same capacity, except through uh, radiation. And so light and so low power that it can be put on mountaintops. 
now that can be done. So the second problem they had was, look, our professionals who man these towers all come from Punjab and Maharashtra and Bangalore. They cannot even think of going on top of mountains. So we said, why not build an army of mountain men and women, train them in, their, in our institute to deal with uh, the Li-Fi technology of orienting the dishes to work on the signals all over the mountains. So if you engage young mountain people as the engineers who are shepherds, who are like ibexes on the mountains, they can easily man or woman the equipment on the mountain tops. And now you're using the mountains as a tower, as a huge tower and 10 kilometers is the range. So with some mountain top Li-Fi towers, you could cover the whole of the region of Ladakh, for example, with high band internet, which means that even the most distant villages will get high uh, bandwidth internet, which means that you can have vocation um, settings in the deepest, remotest villages. And if that works there, it can be applied throughout. And Nepal is an ideal case because uh, of its remoteness uh, in mountains and you know, people who go for vocation need to only deal with the hardship of traveling only once because they go for long stays of month or two. So this could become a great opportunity of sustainable ecotourism where people learn about the culture, immerse, help teach young people in the villages, learn both ways. And perhaps in future, this becomes the beginnings of a software industry that is dispersed like handicraft in the mountains so that Youth from these mountains themselves become the software engineers and are living in their own mountain villages with all the infrastructure in place. I could go on and on, but I think there's a lot of hope even amidst all the, um, you know, gloomy uh, scenario that uh, COVID poses. But the mountains um, for ecotourism have a lot of opportunities and we would like to explore together with you all uh, for the whole of the Himalayas and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sunam, sir, for those words and also for all these examples. It's been very inspirational. Uh, without further ado, uh, we will now move on to the panel that we have set for you today. I would like to request our colleague Anu Didi, Anu Kumari Lama, our tourism specialist, to kind of start this session. Um, so Anu Didi, please. A very good afternoon to all the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would also like to start this panel discussions uh, wishing us all happy International Mountain Day and more happier for me because this year's theme is all about sustainable mountain tourism. So it gives us all, always a, a great feeling to be able to stand here and have the sessions or uh, panel discussions organized. As you can see from the title, uh, the whole aspects of this panel discussion is all about trying to understand is sustainable mountain tourism can it be a recovery and if, uh, you know, a green or sustainable or resilient recovery from the perspective of shocks? And as you've already understood from the previous discussions, uh, the idea of shocks is very much focused around COVID. Um, before I uh, invite all our esteemed panel members, I thought uh, you know, it would be good to reiterate some of the very insightful uh, questions or statements and also the ideas that were shared by our um, keynote speaker, Mr. Sunang Mangchuk. Uh, one thing that really struck me today was, it's a very simple question that was raised by Isabella. What does mountain means for us, right? At Isimod, we always say mountains matter. Many a times we really look, the mountain matters for the people, but the panel discussions, actually what we're trying to understand is, 
the esteemed panel members' perspective, because we are uh, in our own, uh, uh, you know, uh, stature or the background that we come from, we are also serving from the mount for the mountains. So perhaps this is an opportunity for us also to really reflect upon what does it mean for us in a way that we can better serve the mountain communities and our landscape. And the other one is quite an interesting that is sustainable mountain tourism really the answer to build back better mountain tourism? And from the keynote speaker's perspective, it seems this is a, there is a silver lining. You know, there is a possibilities, but the solution has to be innovative and locally driven. So this is an opening statement, which I really liked, you know, a food for thought for us, but definitely the panel discussion is going to be quite open, reflective, and we would like to be also critical at some point because the pandemic has given us, you know, a mixed feeling in a sense, because today, December 2021, remember ourselves back in December 2019, that was a day when this whole world came into an abrupt halt. Two years down the line, you know, this COVID has given us a picture, a picture of both frightful picture, but also beautiful. Frightful in a sense, because we have realized how dependent our mountain communities are in the, uh, for the tourism and also because of the disruption that has happened. But beautiful in a sense, we have also seen an unprecedented positive changes happening because of the COVID. You know, the glimpses of the mountain from the city centers, the, you know, a reclaiming of the, you know, some of the landscapes, you know, the nature has healed in a, such a way that we could never even imagine. So we have, so this frightful picture as well as the beautiful, in a way it's our challenges as well as opportunities. So this is the, uh, this, this panel discussion is organized to really sit with our panel members and understand what are the challenges and opportunity? And is there a hope for our mountains and our people using sustainable tourism as a recovery strategy? So without much further ado, I would like to invite uh, in the stage, uh, Ms. Ayusa Prasai, Chief Executive Officer, Community Homestay Network, Nepal. Thank you, uh, Founding Director, Himalayan Institute of Alternatives, Zilbak. Mr. Michael Croft, UNESCO representative to Nepal and head of the office. And Mr. Deepak Raj Josi, Founding Executive Member, World Tourism Network, Nepal. Just a brief uh, introductions. Um, uh, Ms. Ayusa Prasai, uh, she is the CEO of Community Homestay Network. Uh, the Community Homestay Network is a social enterprise that supports a network of community homestays in Nepal. The whole idea of the Community Homestay Network is really giving an opportunities to the rural mountain communities by creating, curating, and marketing the products that community homestays so that the communities can benefit uh, through such uh, initiatives uh, uh, at a larger scale. Uh, Mr. Deepak Raj Joshi, uh, he is, as I mentioned, is the founding executive member of the World Tourism Networks and a former CEO of Nepal Tourism Board. Um, so he's had a, you know, he's had led uh, several positions, both at the policy and now as a founding executive member. So we've got, you know, looking forward to hear his insights. Uh, Mr. Sonam Vakchuk, no need for introductions because we've already heard from him. He is an innovator education reformist as well as an engineer by profession. Uh, look forward to also uh, some more insights uh, besides from what we've heard during the uh, keynote speech. And Michael Croft, uh, last but not the least, uh, um, he has been prior to being a UNESCO representative Nepal. He has also um, hold many positions um, under uh, UNESCO uh, in different uh, countries uh, or, and parts of the world in Africa, Middle East and Southeast Asia. Um, so um, a bit of a house rule, this panel discussion is for almost an hour, um, but what we wanted to really do is just to make it a bit, because we wanted to hear and learn from each other, so it's all about being more open and uh, also frank uh, and also much more interactive. So what we've done is, uh, first part of this panel will be for 30 minutes. Uh, we have shared some guiding questions to our panel members, and I hope, uh, you know, we would keep to our limits. Uh, so each question is around two minutes. You may not also take two minutes as such, but 
So 30 minutes for our, uh, for our panel discussions and followed by 30 minutes that would be open for uh, questions and answers uh, from the floor. Um, I think I would like to start with the ladies first, uh, Ayusha. Um, so um, as you've heard uh, from, the, uh, uh, from what has been uh, discussed uh, a while ago, uh, how uh, as a community homestay networks in the perspective of shocks, right? Could you please highlight some of the activities linked with the sustainable mountain tourism uh, from the perspective of community homestay networks? Uh, uh, good afternoon. Dr. Anu, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to today's panel discussion. Um, um, while talking about community homestay and our role in promoting mountain tourism is, when we think about Nepal, it's always about the mountains and the beautiful mountains, the range. So we almost think about the physical aspect of the mountains. And also, because of that, we are we are able to attract a lot of um, tourists or travelers to the trails and famous uh, destinations. So one thing is we are able to put Nepal in a picture, but other thing is we are also stereotyping Nepal as only the physical aspect or the natural component of the mount mountains. So what we try to do at Community Homestay Network is uh, able to curate a holistic approach uh, in a way that will not be only uh, promoting the natural aspect. Yes, we are proud of the natural things, not saying we are not, but mountains are beyond that. Like I think the questions you just raised before we started the discussion. So it's very important to see the cultural aspect. So what we are trying to do is uh, promote culture, uh, culture and the experiences in the mountain areas. For example, um, Tatupani, uh, I'm sure whoever have been to Annapurna Trek is a very popular stop. So uh, while Tatupani being a very popular uh, spot, it has also been able to um, add a lot of um, burden to the area itself, the scarcity of the resources, and even um, not being able to manage like the waste management uh, per se. So what we are trying to uh, do is promote alternative destinations through community homestays, which will not only be able to uh, promote um, destinations beyond the popular ones, but also able to address the issues of over tourism that we usually highlight when it's about mountain tourism. So we're trying to prolong the stay. So build the um, cultural experiences and um, the experiences, I think it was also addressed during the key, uh, keynote address that it's not just about the destination, uh, accommodation, it's about the journey. So we are trying to build that perspective around it. Also curating the circuit um, concept, not just promoting one area in the mountain areas, but when we talk about the Annapurna Trail and trekking area, so we are trying to uh, insert the community's homestays in between. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for providing such a comprehensive picture of what you do as a community homestay network uh, in the scope of, you know, not only limited to the mountains, mountain plus, right, the culture as well as other aspects of the economy. And you've raised an interesting point, I think, which we will not discuss. It's about, it's not really about, uh, you know, um, how, uh, whether they are getting benefits or not, but the issue of over tourism. I think one aspect of sustainable mountain tourism uh, that we are facing is also over tourism. Uh, prior to COVID, this was a major issue. So perhaps, uh, so we can, with that answer, can transition the whole idea of what the challenges are. And if I may request Mr. Deepak Raj Joshi is in regards to the challenges, uh, you know, um, taking, I know, uh, taking the ideas from what she was saying about over tourism, but then COVID happened, right? So how do we understand the whole idea of challenges for the sustainable mountain tourism taking these, but COVID as one of the major issues? Thank you, uh, Anupi. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, extend our special thanks to EC Mode for a very relevant, relevant day. Uh, secondly, uh, on behalf of Nepal's Travel and Tourism Fraternity, we are happy to welcome a very special person, Mr. Sonam Wangchuk, to Nepal. 
Uh, regarding uh, the mountain tourism context, I think uh, so far, so far mountain uh, tourism uh, is limited or concentrated in the adventure-based activities and in few individual resorts. So uh, the demand is huge. Uh, uh, demand is so high. Uh, and and uh, so far, while talking about the mountain destinations, it is basically a uh, buyer-based market. The sellers are not so aggressive or from that perspective, sellers are not yet, uh, uh, trying to, uh, I mean, position themselves as a very unique destination. So in this line, and another thing I would like to highlight one uh, small context while talking about tourism. Uh, we, we call our modern tourism, uh, the history of modern tourism is roughly around uh, 70 years, nearly 70 decade. So in past, uh, uh, until 2010 or, or 15, uh, it was limited to the very uh, few countries. Uh, and within the countries, a very few uh, destinations and used to be managed by a handful of uh, players. But now, I don't know why and how, it is uh, be becoming the interest of every country and communities. Every community today, they want uh, to develop their areas as a tourist destination. So we have more prospects, prospects, at the same time, more challenges. Especially connecting with the post-pandemic situation. Uh, I think, uh, I think um, when we see most of the surveys, like uh, after the pandemic or during the pandemic, what kind of destinations you are willing to choose? So in most of the surveys, they say, nature-based destinations, uh, isolation-based activities, and less crowded areas, which are uh, purely the mountain-based activities. So the demand is so high. Uh, and, and in challenge side, I think, uh, for example, uh, to exemplify in Nepal, uh, in regards of Nepal is, uh, itself, when we don't have uh, much uh, inbound visitors, I mean the international visitors, we have higher number of uh, domestic travelers. Uh, to be very honest, uh, in our region, I think that our travelers need a little bit of orientation, education about the responsible traveling and uh, the sustainable practices to follow while traveling. So that is also another thing. I think there are a few points I will add later. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I think I'm, I'm happy because all answers are really transitioning. If you flip to the you know, question that I, I could ask the next, next panelist, because where you ended, right, it's somewhat something to do with the awareness, educations, and that's where I think UNESCO is one of the prime, you know, it's about increasing the importance of the, the, the heritage as well as, you know, the values of, of, a, of a mountain as such, but all the intangible and intangible, whether it's cultural as well as, you know, other aspects. So I guess, you know, um, the challenges that Mr. Deepak Joshi has presented was primarily its market lead challenges he highlighted. Beyond that, as a you know somebody who's representing the UNESCO, uh, what challenges did we actually experience in times of COVID in, in our cultural landscapes where we operate in mountains? Your perspective on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you very much, and uh, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here um, today. Um, I can actually say that I'm I'm nervous. I'm not nervous because I'm speaking in public. I like I like public speaking, and um, but it's it's more with a sense of I think it's a combination of anticipation and excitement. Um, also from Sonam's, um, I, you may have you may know him. I I don't know him. I haven't heard of him because I am very new. I've never been to South Asia before. This is my first time in Nepal. I've been here for three months. And so that you can imagine a little bit what it's like to be a representative of UNESCO um, with a mandate to um, greatly expand the organization's uh, activities and partnerships in Nepal. It's just, it's, I'm just in a way almost constantly overwhelmed in a, in a nice way by the richness of not just, the, of course, the natural and cultural heritage of this country, um, which is so concentrated in Nepal, um, but also in terms of, um, the, in a way, it's my first time to deal with mountains. And, and, and in the Hindu Kush Himalaya, what a, what a series of mountains that, that, that I now have. 
Sagamarta remembering being a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So I think um, with regards to uh, your, your question, maybe if I can, how do I say, maybe if I can speak a little bit to how UNESCO sees the question of sustainable tourism here. I think that for you, I don't know if it's surprising for you that UNESCO is working in sustainable tourism or not. Um, we didn't used to be, it hasn't been something that we've been doing over our 75 year history, but it, it came, I think, from as a, as a directly from the World Heritage Sites. So the World Heritage Sites next year are 50 years old. And uh, I'll say something to that maybe a little bit later. But um, so with, as we've seen in, in some of the sites, we've had mass tourism and, and certainly over tourism. And this was a big issue um, in the country where I came from, where I was last representative in Vietnam. Um, their efforts at tourism, increasing tourism worked a little bit too well. And the sites to a certain extent were choking before COVID were choking on the tourism. Uh, but I think that, so there's, a, there's so the World Heritage Committee was, was forced and years ago to look at the question of sustainable tourism. How can UNESCO help the member states and the sites beyond the designation to deal with the questions of sustainable development around world heritage. And now there is a specific program called World Heritage and Sustainable Development. And there is a specific program, Sustainable Tourism for World Heritage. But I think um, also for us, of course, we have the education aspect as well. UNESCO is United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization through in communication to that. So although it's not Although it's not always easy to come up with the right answers, at least we're sort of used to looking through, I guess you could say, different different lenses. And so um, the, in, in terms of the importance of the intangible cultural heritage in these communities, the importance of, of indigenous knowledge um, is, is, is also, these are, these are things, programs and priorities for our other sectors of work. So for us, and I think that uh, in Nepal, moving forward and on this particular question of sustainable tourism, uh, this is now going to be front and center for our program in the country. And I think it will be in a, in a great opportunity where to in, in, in so far as that we want to reconnect with Ethan Rod, if I can put it this way, and, and to make this perhaps one of the focus, the focus points of or focus areas of our collaboration, simply because as was the case in, in, in Vietnam, when you are in a country with such rich cultural and natural heritage, and this is what the country is known for internationally, then for us, we are immediately swept up into a discussion of, of sustainable tourism and how to, help, how to work with the sites to help, again, ensure that local communities benefit from, from in the case of World Heritage, from the designation that, um, that we, don't, we don't see the dark side of world heritage, if you can put it this way, how to disperse that energy that is attracted to the world heritage sites into the local communities and into the air, and also how to use science and technology to be innovative around uh, for the local communities in terms of the, the, the you know, the, the li, li, life, li, why? Li-fi, yeah, sorry, which was so, so interesting. And we'll have to have a side conversation about that. I'll stop there because I, I, I could kind of go on forever. As I said, I, there's, there's so many reactions and, and so many, I have so many reactions to the things that we've talked about here. There's so much I want to say, but it, it wouldn't be very fair for the members of the panel. So I'll stop there, but thank you. Thank you uh, for really uh, taking us through as what UNESCO actually does, but also linking it back to what the questions was originally posed in regards to the challenges. And I think one of the recurrent theme again and again, it's about COVID. Yes, it mattered because this had changed the whole dynamics. But again, the recurrent theme was all about over tourism, mass tourism, heritage sites being overcrowded, like almost loved to death. That was a very famous, uh, you know, sentences that being used when heritage sites were, you know, very much infested by mass tourism. And all. And I guess this is exactly the point where I think we would like to also understand. Yes, we do understand the, the challenges that existed. But I think the COVID was also kind of a wake-up call, right? This is this has been communicated a lot of times, and we've also seen like that we needed some time to give a rest to the mother nature, uh, you know, to the uh, landscape. But communities had also been impacted. But I would really go back to Sonam Wangchuk uh, Ji. Um, of course, from in your keynote speech, you 
given us a lot of insights as to what the opportunity, where the opportunities lie. But I still want to probe further in a sense because you mentioned, right, um, the DAG um, pre-COVID, we've received almost 300,000 tourists. But when I looked at, you know, during the COVID, now this has been almost reduced to about 6,000 or so, right, in, in one year. So there is a massive reduction in the number of tourists. How did the, the, the place like Ladakh, which is so much dependent on tourism, how did it cope with this sort of a challenges, right? That has been very much, suddenly there is no business. So if you could throw some light on that, how did the industry survive during those times? Yes, so um, from my point of view, it was a very timely slap on the people's face who were carried away by the prospects of tourism. No words or sounds I would make would caution them enough to not put all their eggs in the same basket. So they were completely overly becoming dependent on tourism. And um, in a way, I'm happy that uh, this came as an alarm uh, for the people to see that uh, tourism is after all, as I always used to say, it's like a you know, little bird that is scared of any geopolitical conflicts, any you know, military interventions that happen in the border areas, any financial problems in the source countries and so on. But none of that you know, could uh, scratch even the surface of the people's thought. So this was a very good wake up call. And um, it also made people value uh, village life, agriculture. Suddenly they could see, they were forced to go back to their villages and you know, sense the clean air and community bonding and so on. Actually, COVID was a blessing for many people. I have seen um, 80 year old grandmothers uh, thank the gods and thank whatever this COVID uh, uh, God is that made their grandchildren come home and stay for the whole summer that she had never seen in her you know, old age. So suddenly it uh, made people see things as they are and not completely uh, you know, sell their land and everything for tourism. So it has been that way a very positive thing. And again, as I said, um, this is also a good shake to see that tourism can and needs to be taken into the hinterlands. Um, people talk of uh, ca carrying capacity a lot when we talk of uh, tourism in Ladakh. And three lakh is beyond the carrying capacity uh, people think. Then I was doing a back of the envelope calculation and I came to the conclusion that 300,000 is a limit uh, to the carrying capacity of the places you have now. But if you spread it out, you know, this five square kilometers or so, Yes, it is way beyond the carrying capacity. But if you spread it out to 50,000 square kilometers, which Ladakh is, then you could have 10 times more uh, and without the environmental impact and actually positive economic impact to the rural areas. So they don't have to leave for anywhere. So this is how we see it in Ladakh. So first year was a big shock for people. Um, you know, there were psychological um, stress problems, psychiatrists were needed. Second year, two things happened. Uh, one is people adjusted themselves to various other possibilities. And secondly, tourism came back, especially in Ladakh. It was a surprise that it came back. Um, and uh, that was perhaps because people in India could not travel to any other country. So many of them came to Ladakh, the high-end ones. So it was a good mix. Thank you uh, for really uh, taking us through how actually the communities went through in the times of COVID. Uh, I would like to just highlight two key four words here. One was, you know, when it was a blessing in disguise because nature got its chance to breathe, 
older people got a chance to rekindle its relationships and all. So, but then you also mentioned that tourism came back luckily, right? I mean, although now we are again talking about other variants and all, but still there is a hope and it's going to rebound, right? So in that regards now, you know, based on our experiences now, where do we go from here? Can this be a, an effective recovery strategy to address the shocks in relation to not only the shocks, maybe some of the unprecedented positive impacts that we have seen, right? Nature coming back and then, you know, we've seen the wild animals going to, you know, sighted in the cities, mountain visibilities. This was something we could never imagine. So once the economy opens, right? So how can we ensure that these positive changes can be sustained? So how can we leverage sustainable mountain tourism as a tool or as a driver to ensure that the recovery happens in a sustainable manner? This is an open question to all four of you. If any one of you would like to start first, I would keep that uh, without being pointing out. Any one of you would like to start the question. Okay. I think, uh, first of all, uh, the mountain region or the Himalayan region, it has a very strong spiritual uh, connection or value, but uh, in regards of tourism, it is not connected yet well. We can, uh, we can develop something, I mean, the, the kind of orientation or stories related to spiritual values. It can help uh, to, to, to balance, to create balance. Second thing is, uh, there are so many examples while uh, sailing uh, Everest as an expedition from big companies. Another reason is I think destinations are sustainable then only when uh, destinations are cared by all these stakeholders, it's are shared equally from local level to uh, the, the final level. And uh, third thing is, I think, We have very good examples. Not only today, I think 40 years back, our Annapurna conservation model is, was one of the best models, but these 40, 45 years, we have not been able to replicate the successful models to Kanchanjanga or Khattar or Dolpa areas. I think there are very good successful models within the region, Bhutan, Ladakh, Nepal, but these uh, models or experiences are not uh, replicated by our own other regions. For example, Sunamji mentioned about the carrying capacity issues. Yes, when we talk about the 60,000 visitors in Namche only, then it is an issue. But when we, we, we can disperse them to Kanchanjanga, to Dolpa, to Apisaipal, Himal, then it is nothing. So, so that kind of uh, things, if we can manage, I think uh, uh, we, we can do it better. And uh, last thing I would like to say, like usually after the crisis, we talk about building back better. Everywhere we talk about building back better. But our focus should be more on uh, building better before. So, so these are the some things I wanted to share. Thank you. On the subject of building back better, we, did, we have a bit of a window of opportunity. It's true. Everyone starts seeing gold in their eyes. And I, and I know I appreciate very much what you said in terms of pre-COVID, having discussions about, with, about sustainable tourism in places like Haolong Bay and Hoi An. Um, I was, it was, you know, you would talk about um, high revenue, low impact, think about sustainability, et cetera. It's not all about the numbers. And you just had the impression that everyone was saying, yes, but gold, man, gold. Um, and COVID-19 has concentrated the mind. Uh, from a practical point of view, um, we have an opportunity next year to, I think, to take this discussion quite further. I, I brought this with me. Um, for those of you who can't see it, it's, it says the next 50. Next year is the 50th, I mentioned the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage and UNESCO next year will have a global initiative to discuss about the next 50. What is the future of, of, what is the future of World Heritage in the face of climate change, in the face of the pandemic? 
What do we truly value as societies? What do we want to take forward? What has to change, so to speak? And sustainable tourism is one of the particular themes of, of this. And, and, and for me, this is, this is where UNESCO adds value insofar as that the, using, the organiz, using the organization as a platform. So what we would intend to do next year, and probably using Saigamata as, since it's world heritage and since it's so visible, is to have this discussion on the next 50. Um, it doesn't have to be confined to Sagamarta. We're also interested in, in talking about the next 50 in Lumbini for different reasons, if I can put it this way. But around this, this is, this is also going to be a conversation, a national, seen as a national dialogue that is going to be linked to a global dialogue. So I just want to put that on the table as something that we were already discussing with government. I think ECMOD is a natural partner um, for this to move ahead. And, and it doesn't, it's not just about one event. It can be a discussion throughout the year. Um, but we have an opportunity to try to get this right because God knows we're moving in the wrong direction quite quickly. And we need to hear from the young people. We need to hear from indigenous groups. We need to hear from those, those communities how to say which, which have the answers, which will probably, which can turn this thing around, so to speak. And that's very much UNESCO's intention. So I just, the opportunity to put that out there. Thank you. We are, I'm extremely mindful of the time, so we still have to, um, if I could request you be very brief, uh, you know, so thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, adding to their points, what I wanted to emphasize is that as a private sector, we are trying to promote community-based tourism. It's because we want to expand the uh, time for the visitors to visit any place. Uh, so that people won't be just attracted to the natural or physical beauty, but then a place or destination is beyond that. But I think um, as a private sector, I'd also like uh, this space to be a platform where I could share that we would need strong partnerships to come from government side, uh, bilateral agencies, uh, intergovernmental agencies. And we are so fortunate that this year we have forged partnership with EC Mode. And we have been uh, trying to work in Kanchenjunga landscape to build a community trek circuit on that. So uh, like two weeks ago, we went for the trek. So I think partnership as such will really help us to promote um, and leverage uh, the economic uh, value that we want to put in the mountain region. Thank you. why the tourism of the last 50, 70 years has been not sustainable, I think, because it was a way of rich people in rich countries or cities to go to new places with their bubble around them, you know, bringing all the uh, same way of life and comfort or luxury or extravagance to the new place. I think that needs to change. And uh, the new generation is very much uh, for such uh, breaking away from such uh, conventional you know, ideas. Therefore, tourism of the future needs to be redefined into experience uh, you know, opportunities. And homestays, hotels, villages should become experience centers where you don't take all your um, extravagance with you, but rather go to experience different parts of the planet and value that as explorers used to do. So um, it's like ancient futures, how it started with exploring mind of uh, pioneers has to come back to that, so that exploring becomes a mainstream thing for people and exploring means uh, immersing yourself in the experiences rather than taking your experience. Um, um, I, I'm very happy to really have this rich discussion. So we have five minutes, maybe we can be given five more minutes as a 10 minutes for an interactions. If my, if I, if I, my, I would be allowed. Now the floor is actually open. Uh, if I could, uh, if there's anybody interested in, yeah. So I already have one hand raised. Um, yes, Kulanji, kindly, kindly uh, a very short introduction of yourselves and who you are wanting to ask this question. Uh, 
observed or heard from others that sustainable tourism is uh, take away for different people very different uh, uh, ideas. I didn't see the whole, the completeness of the solution uh, and the actors of the planners and solution designers, whether it's from a, a supply side or whether it's from a demand side. Um, so even for the, uh, from the demand side, if people are coming with their own orientation, but until and unless there is a no long solution to make them feel that we have innovative product or traditional product or whatever product is there. So tourism is, and another aspect of tourism is that there's so much in interdependent on so many things, water, air, uh, biodiversity, housing, uh, uh, like uh, uh, this transport, energy, so many things are there. That means you need to have a number of planners to come together and make a concrete plan out of it. And even for urbanization, for a small town, if you are for one village, we are developing a plan, but what about a town? What about a city? How those are interconnected? And in, in terms of interdisciplinariness, how those are interconnected? These are still quite a separate things for, uh, for different uh, people in different government. Kulam, yes. is this a question or your uh, yeah, yeah. I, question? Question is coming. Who are coming, you asking coming, this question? Coming to that. Given that context in view, is there a real potential for number of governments to come together, like a sister city program type of a thing, or mountain to mountain, mountain communities can come together and develop an ideal solution with the breadth and depth of uh, uh, depth and breadth of with the solution. Asking these questions, who do you want you to Maybe ask? Maybe given the, the depth of the experience of uh, uh, Sonam, so I, I will refer to, to him, because he is the one who can lead their depth and breadth. Not sure I can fully understand, but what I agree is there's a lot of need to understand and therefore to study the various aspects and dynamics of uh, the thing like tourism and its impact on mountains. I'm not sure about uh, people coming together, but definitely there should be centers of such studies in each of our mountain regions and countries, and they should come together and collaborate and cooperate. Um, as for us in Ladakh, uh, our, our dream is that like uh, I told you about the Himalayan Institute of Alternatives Ladakh, we would like to see a Himalayan Institute of Alternatives Nepal, a Himalayan Institute of Alternatives Bhutan, a Himalayan Institute of Alternatives, you know, Skardu, Baltistan. And such institutes should focus on the context of their region, while at the same time uh, opening up to other regions and synergizing and energizing each other to find uh, fine-tuned solutions to a mastery is what I would hope for. Yes, Mandira ji. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting uh, discussions here. Um, what I thought uh, I um, talk about or rather bring to your attention is this, uh, um, you talked about, one of you talked about um, after crisis, we normally have um, building back um, better, but uh, the emphasis um, should be now more on building um, bet better before, right? So it's not building back better, but building better before. So in that context, I was wondering whether um, any kind of climate information plays a role? What kind of role would it play in terms of building uh, better before? Yeah, so that's kind of an open question, but uh, with the experiences from uh, Sonamji, it would be interesting to also hear. I don't know about um, what context of climate information um, you mean, but I do think that 
the COVID uh, pandemic has reminded us of things not going well. Yeah? So it, uh, it really is a good uh, opportunity to change our ways. Just the way Delhi saw how clear and blue their skies were when they were locked down or how clean the water of the Yamuna can be. Similarly, around the world, people saw that uh, nature could be given a chance and uh, to refresh and that you don't really have to own everything in the world to be happy. Actually being with your near and dear ones, uh, even if locked up, gives a lot of uh, satisfaction and happiness in life. It doesn't take the planet to make you happy. So um, that kind of uh, shake I think this opportunity should be used at, as because from every angle we are learning that the way we were going, you know, everything was not right. So um, given all that we are learning about climate change and the effects on the environment and the learning from the COVID experience that things can be done differently. COVID was perhaps the biggest climate action ever. <laughs> you know, not voluntarily. But imagine if it was done for climate, you know, that people can do. So that kind of um, use makes it possible. It's very quickly. Thank you very much. Um, this is a proposition to the, uh, to the uh, overall panel, but specifically to our honorable uh, representative to uh, UNESCO. Uh, you see, I mean, when it comes to heritage sites, they carry a legacy behind and there is a criteria. Yeah, and the, given the climate change impacts, impacting the mountain communities, uh, uh, as, as we call it, the, the, the pulse of the planet, you know, the kind of impacts we are seeing, mountains themselves, <laughs> they, they, they simply qualify to become the heritage, to actually protect the, the, the peoples of the planet. Just a proposition, thank you. Yes, I, I think just as a, and this is I think why we we'll got 50 in the discussion next year around Sagamata, that we would want to use not, not necessarily to have Sagamata focus as an example or as a spoke, spokesperson for, but I, 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 your point is, is, is entirely well taken. Thank you. And this is actually one of the reasons I think why, why this rejoining of UNESCO and ECMOD is so important because I found out I didn't know lots of things I didn't know. UNESCO created, helped create ECMOD in 1981. So we're like the prodigal parent. We're coming back to you after all these years. It's not that there hasn't been collaboration, but it's been, it's been sort of tactical, not so much strategic. The organization wants to change that now. And the best way that we can do, um, or, or to, to, to do what you're suggesting, is also to, to reconnect with ECMOD and work with ECMOD in, in a more strategic way, because of course, we also can complement um, in terms of visibility uh, and scale and, in, and bring different aspects to ECMOD's work. It's a, it's, it's a very, I mean, we're like, I feel like I'm in front of family here, even if I've never met most of you. So please, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, Rupert, I think this will be our last questions. We are, or I, if, if there's any burning, but Rupert, please, yes. Thank you. Um, we heard from the uh, panel discussions of, you know, what are the ingredients which are required for sustainable tourism. But I think the challenge which is there is if you look around in terms of the government policies and the government approaches which are there, none of the governments are talking about the ingredients that you require for sustainable tourism. My question to the panelists, all four of you, one single point in terms of what is the key action that you require for the governments to change their perspectives and bring about policies and action for ensuring sustainable tourism?
So thank you for the question. Actually, in terms of, so I'll be speaking on behalf of community homestays and the policy behind it. So um, actually, um, Nepal government has policies and they are trying to prioritize community homestays. And they have also given the power to local governments uh, about the fund and the trainings. But the problem is the lack of standardization and certification of community homestays. How do we define that? So I think if they could also work on these kind of things, like as a private sector, we are trying to work with external consultant and trying to bring um, a national level um, we already have international certifications like travel life and everything, right? But in community level, it's very expensive and we cannot enforce it to them. So we, as a private sector, are trying to build a certification and standardization process, but there is always a question. So for me personally, when I am working on these kind of documentation, so where is the government? So I think there should be the criteria. Like they are supportingly, uh, supporting us in capacity building, giving funds to expand, but not every household can be termed as a homestay. So where is the standardization and certification? So I think government can really work on that uh, process and as well, take it as a project as well. Thank you. I think the, <clears throat> to influence policies of the government, while on one hand, advocacy with the government is good, but it's not enough in democracies. In democracies, governments follow people's moods and desires because they live off the votes of the people. So I have always believed that alongside advocacy, uh, you have to do advocacy for people to change their mindset and their readiness to new ideas. Um, and when you have people behind already mature and aware, governments find it very fertile ground to make the best of policies. I'll give you just an example. Two years ago in India, Prime Minister Modi, who has been very proactive with environment, almost too proactive, announced a ban on single-use plastic. I thought this was wonderful, I, too good to be true. And sure enough, within two weeks, he had to take it back. Why? Because the people were not aware and mature enough to do that. They actually either spoke against or didn't speak when the industry lobby prevailed. So it failed with the best of intentions. Now, that was 2019, I think. Go back to 1995. In Ladakh, there was no talk of any issues with single-use plastic, almost in whole of India and maybe in the world. Just because of civil society action, plastic was voluntarily uh, stopped by the people of Ladakh and that social ban continues till date. When people are aware and mature, governments follow. When they are not, even the best of policies fail. So I think uh, people at large, our, our kind of organizations should invest in advocacy with the government, but even more in advocacy with the people. I am very, very mindful of the time on this. I will be very brief because that question was posed to all four panelists uh, in answer to what should the government do. Just very brief answers. Thank you. Question was. <laughs> <laughs> he was asking, you know, many a times it's the government's role also, you know, that needs to play a significant, uh, you know, uh, uh, play a role in regards to having the sustainable tourism. Yeah, it, I don't, it's, 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 it's not, how to say this is no, no great revelation, but I think it's true is you have to come at it from a lot of different angles. Um, it has to, there has to be a discussion. First of all, you, you have to have support within the private sector uh, for it. There has to be, you have to, again, work on terms of the advocacy and the education aspect in terms of the, the, the local communities, and then, and then have a, have a conversation with the government. And, and, and to, to demonstrate somehow in, in a way that how it is in the government's self-interest and political interest, um, if you can 
if you can find in, in a way and tap into a political angle, it always makes it better. Um, but certainly for us, uh, how to say, looking at Nepal and thinking, you know, for me, it's like you have a, there's a billion Indians on one, a billion Chinese on the other. The, the, you have tourists for, for eternity, as long as these member states continue to exist. So Nepal can afford to take a very long term. This is what, I, in, a, in a way, what we're kind of hoping to do in discussions with the government to encourage this because you can afford to take a very long term view of things because you don't, you don't, you. These are people who are dreaming of, of leaving very crowded cities and very crowded places and coming to to breathe fresh mountain air and smell the flowers and look at the birds, so to speak. And they will want to do that for a very long time. Um, so it's also trying to, um, how to say, um, caution a little bit in terms of the overdevelopment and also to provide examples that make sense where they should that 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 can help um, demonstrate to the government that in the long term, this is in also their economic interest as well. But as Songam said, in democracies, you know, people have mandates for four or five years and they do tend to look at the short term. So it's easier said than done. Thank you. I think uh, the questions about uh, building better before, uh, it was mentioned in the context like, uh, in my experience, I have been seeing uh, our tourism since last 20, 22 years. Uh, when we talk about crisis as disaster, one single crisis or disaster is temporary, but crisis and disasters are permanent. Every after three, five, four years, we are having some kind of uh, crisis. So it is better to talk more about before. So that was uh, talked in that context. Uh, second, regarding the actions that government or government bodies can take. Uh, so far in our region, most of the DMOs or NTOs, National Tourism Organizations or Ministry of Tourism, the target they set is doubling the number or bringing this much of number to the destination. That's, that is considered as the success, which should not be. Uh, and, and the governments, they are, they are awarding uh, the highest, uh, the agency who bring highest number of tourists, the agencies who pay highest number of tax, uh, from those number of tourists. So it should be not only the uh, rewarding uh, return on investment, rather rewarding the new initiatives. So that also uh, can, uh, uh, can help. And uh, third thing is mostly governments, especially in our region, we make very, very tough and rigid policies. In policy, it is always very tough and rigid. But while it comes to the monitoring, it is very, very, almost negligible. So it should be reversed, then I think certainly we can bring some changes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with this, we've come to uh, the end of the panel discussions. Uh, before we really end, I think uh, the very first questions that I had, uh, you know, what does mountain means for us? And is sustainable mountain tourism is really the answer to really address the recovery aspects from shocks. And I think I would just like to highlight on what uh, Sonamji has mentioned earlier, like, there is some sort of a new evolutions happening in the mindset of the travelers and also in the industries, like, you know, more focus on the experience-based uh, economy, tourism and activity, and there lies the future as well as the key. So I think this really gives us stories of hope and possibilities. And I'm glad that we, we all see that, you know, uh, tourism can be or sustainable mountain tourism can be a tool that we can recover effectively from the socks. With this, I would really like to thank our esteemed panel members. May I please have a round of applause to all the panel members? And thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anudidi and all the panelists for that really exciting conversation. Um, yes, we are kind of running a little on time. So without further ado, uh, I think we've come to that section of the day where we talk about and award our memor our mountain prize, uh, the first Dr. Andrea Shield Memorial Mountain Prize. So for that, I would like to invite our Director General, Dr. Pema Jamsul. Thank you very much, Maxim. And I would like to begin by thanking uh, Sonoma Onchula 
for the very inspiring talk. I think you have brought to life so many good examples from Ladakh. I remember Ladakh as a moonscape, a land of, you know, almost like the moon that we saw, uh, you know, in photos and pictures. But even in that condition, you're able to come up with so many innovations that would have applications across the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. That village that you call Kulum, I think there are so many Kulums across our region and so many of those ideas could be replicated and so on. So as it is, that uh, the theme is sustainable tourism for mountains. We have a very interesting panel discussion. Once again, thank you all the panelists for sharing your very valuable thoughts on how we can take tourism forward. Now, it is inevitable that tourism, ecotourism in all its forms, be it mountaineering, be it hiking, trekking, camping, you know, whatever, is going to be there as a mainstay of mountain economy. Agriculture alone is not going to be enough. So that is a given. But as Sonamla said, let us not put all the eggs in one basket. You know, tourism is not the solution for everything. We have to spread out the risk. Resilience is about spreading risk, about reducing dependence on any particular you know, field. So I think he has rightly pointed out that we should not put everything in one basket, but tourism integrated or supported by other forms of livelihood. You know, yak herding is one, you know, uh, mountain agriculture, herbs and so on, it has to be. So I think one of the things that we should remember in is diversification of tourism products. Diversification in terms of products and services, diversification in terms of clients. We can have pilgrims visiting, you know, all these sites. We can have wellness tourism, you know, targeted at uh, special, you know, groups of people and so on. So with the COVID, I think it is, you know, as uh, all the panelists rightly pointed out, it's a wake up call. We have seen what can be done if we give a break to nature. And I think that has come out very clearly. And also it has given time for people to innovate. I think one of the things that came up is also, you know, the one is diversification, the other one is domestic tourism. We never thought of ourselves as tourists. You know, we always thought people coming from the West or from Japan or Korea as tourists. Maybe not ourselves, not Nepalese, not Britannese. But now we also know that we can have tourism, domestic tourism. And I think there's a big, big learning. And then vocation that Sonamla mentioned. I think that's a brilliant idea. And I think this could be applied to not just in Ladakh, but you know, everywhere. And there is one thing in Bhutan, somebody came out with a thing called virtual tourism. So in one hour, that person is able to take a group of tourists virtually on a track to Mount Everest base camp you know, and charge $10 instead of $100, or, you know, $80 instead of $800. And you know, he's sitting there and earning. So there's so many things that came up, but we have a lot to do. Sustainability is a three-legged chicken. I always remember that. Once we had a professor on the ECMO board said sustainability is like chasing a three-legged chicken. You, know, you never catch it. But it's not true that governments don't have policies. We have extremes. Look at Bhutan, we have limited tourism and perhaps even restricted tourism. Look at Nepal, we have the other end. You know, somewhere we have to find the middle path. We have to find sustainability. We cannot sustain 500 people going up Mount Everest every day or every week. Uh, and we have been to Machu Picchu in uh, Peru. Uh, about what, 10,000 tourists a week or day? In a week, 10,000 tourists. Here we are talking about 300. But they are managed better because they are organized better. They have a better destination plan. So we have to learn from outside the region, from across the region, but we have to aim at tourism. As already pointed out, Nepal has such a rich heritage, natural heritage, Mount Everest, Mount Annapurna. Machu Picchu, what not. We have eight of the 14, 8,000 8, meters peak in Nepal. Why can't Nepal give break, give a year's break in turn to one of these mountains? Give Mount Everest a break every eight years, let it recover. Give Annapurna a break every eight years, let it still going on. We are not depriving the people dependent on industries. But tourism, let me say that 
it is one sector that benefits everyone across the sectors, from the taxi drivers to the ticketing agents, to the farmers, to the herders, you know, to the guides. So I think this is something that uh, is on this day, the International Mountain Day with the theme of sustainable tourism. Let us all think about how we can bring about sustainable tourism in the HKH region. Uh, sorry, I had, I could not restrain myself from making these comments, but we learned a lot from all of you. And I think for Ayusha, the challenge is, we always talk about building back better, but if the opportunities come now, if there is a V-shaped recovery from tourism, is there anybody waiting for building it back better or we just jump on the opportunity and go back doing the same thing? And that is the question that I would like to post. And thank you, Michael. I think we have uh, talked a lot. I think we need you know, to think as a region. You know, we have so much to offer in Nepal, but we have much more to offer as a region. And the more people can see experience at a lesser cost, the more attractive this destination becomes. So we need to keep that in the picture and work towards that. Now let us go to the prize. Sorry, Lori, we will now go to the, I think Isabella has already uh, given the background, but this year we decided to rename our mountain prize as Dr. Andreas Shell Memorial Mountain Prize. Now Andreas was uh, DG, Director General here between 2008 and 2012, 13? 2007 to 2012, 2011, yes. So unfortunately, tragically, he you know, died last month uh, after a bitter struggle with cancer. So we lost him on the 15th of uh, November precisely. So, and he has done a lot uh, you know, for ECMO. Uh, you know, he has actually, as Isabella mentioned, brought ECMO to where it is now you know, build the credibility of this in, you know, institution, you know, build its uh, profile. And so I think we need to honor him and honor him with not something is a one-off event, but something that, you know, help us remember him. So in honor of him, we have called it now the uh, Dr. Andrew Shield Memorial Mountain Prize. And this prize is for our partners in the region who come up with a, you know, innovative solution for sustainable development in sustainable mountain development. And I think this year there are several winners and uh, without uh, further ado, I would just go straight to the announcements. So first of all, I'm honored to announce the, the honorable mentions for uh, Dr. Andres Schild Memorial Mountain Prize, which is the Gurunjur Welfare Organization of Gizer District of Gilgit, Baltistan, Pakistan. So my eyesights are also not so sustainable. So I have to read that. This small youth-led NGO collected donations among youth during the pandemic to support Guranjur village development activities, including COVID awareness and relief activities. Although a very new organization, the selection committee was impressed with their commitment to participatory, transparent, youth-led community issue identification and engagement. So for this, they are recognized and given this honorary mention. Another honorable mention for this uh, memorial, memorial Mountain Prize is to the Samduk Jongkar Initiative located in Bewatang, Bhutan. This is also a relatively... <laughs> Thank you. This is also a relatively new initiative which focused during the pandemic on urban farming and support to small scale producers. The selection committee noted that it can be transformative in the long run with positive implications on nutritional improvement. This initiative turned the COVID-19 crisis into an opportunity for self-sufficiency. Now I will announce the winners. I'm honored now to mention the winners of the 2021 Dr. Andreas Schild Memorial Mountain Prize. And I will begin with our friends who are joining us virtually, the Mahila Umang Producers Company located in Ranikhet, Uttarakhand, India. Okay, let me read first of all. Uh, this registered company 
is a collective of self-help groups and producer members engaged in promoting sustainable livelihoods through establishment of micro enterprises. The objective of UMAM is to initiate pro-poor enterprises directly controlled by producer members based on the principles of fair trade and guided by the concerns of ecology, economy, and equity. As a women producer collective, including 165 self-help groups with a membership of over 2,500 women, the primary work allows small-scale producers increased access to markets through collecting local products. The pandemic response was crowdfunded, fundraising for addressing immediate COVID crisis with supplies and strengthening organizational cohesion, contributing to long-term transformative change. Congratulations to Ms. Indira Rawat and Ms. Anita Paul, who are representing the organization. We are eager to hear a few remarks from you after the announcements are complete. It will be the award to you, and I will hand over to a representative here. Uh, Namaskar. I am Indra Rawat, Maila Umang Producer Company, Uttarakhand Rani Khetse. Mountain Prize 2021 is a great team. I am a great team. I am a great team. Thank you. Thank you. यह सम्मान जब आज पूरा देश कोरोना से जूझ रहा है हमारे सामूहिक विश्वास को आगे लाने में हमारी यह मदद कर रहा है पर्वती महिलाओं के गुणात्मक सुधार लाने के लिए महिला किसानों ने अपनी बाजारी व्यवस्थाएं बरकरार रखने के लिए उसमें सहायक रहे हैं लॉकडाउन के दौरान जहां महिलाएं हमारी लॉकडाउन के दौरान बाजारी व्यवस्थाएं ठप होने के कारण हमने यह निर्णय लिया कि हम अपना ऑनलाइन सेल करेंगे और उसको मजबूत बनाएंगे और करा भी है किया भी हम लोगों ने और हमारे महिलाओं ने निर्णय लिया कि कि जो हमारी बचत सेविंग है सेल्फ हेल्प ग्रुप है जो उनमें से 60 लाख रुपया सामूहिक रूप से वितरण करने का निर्णय भी लिया उमंग ने उमंग ने अपने मित्रों के सहयोग से 10 लाख का कोरोना की कोष जमा किया और 120 परिवारों को जो कोरोना विधवाएं थी बेरोजगार थे उनको वितरण करने में उनकी हम सहायता प्रदान की और चार महीने तक तीन तीन हजार रुपया उनको वितरण किया और उनके आर्थिक स्थिति में सुधार लाने के लिए उनकी मदद की दस स्वास्थ्य केंद्रों में कोरोना किट को और सैनिटाइजर मास्क और वहां के आंगनवाड़ी कार्यकर्ता हैं जो हमारी हैं उनकी सहायता से वहां वितरण किया गए हम हम सब एक जुट होकर अपने कार्यों और हिमालय पर्वत की प्राकृतिक खेती को सामने से जो चुनौतियां हैं उनको उनका सामना करने के लिए एक जुट होकर यह सम्मान को लेने के लिए स्वीकार करते हैं धन्यवाद Hi, uh, Anita Ji, do you hear us? Yes, I do. All right, so if you could just translate us. Yeah, just for Thank a you. quick translation, happy International Mountains Day to all my uh, colleagues in Isimod and everywhere else. It's really an honor to, uh, to receive this uh, award in this year, which has been very challenging for the entire globe, you know. And for Umang, it's really like boosting our uh, enthusiasm even more because uh, at, at a time, sometimes we felt like, I don't know where we were proceeding and whether we would be able to honor our commitment to our members or no. But uh, as Indira mentioned, we together, we took a, a lot of activities together. We, in, we boosted our online sales. We stood by our members and said that the market, uh, the marketing challenges would be addressed in some one way or the other. We kind of did crowdfunding. We used our own savings. And by doing all these multiple things together, we have been able to uh, 
to stand by our commitments to our members. And actually, we have been able to go and achieve at least 80% of a normal uh, turnover in any uh, normal year, even in these challenging times, which has been a great boost. And we've not had to, we did not have any attrition in the organization. We've been able to, uh, to show that mountain communities are resilient and that we can carry forward. But there are challenges, everybody is aware, and Easy Mod and colleagues, especially the mountain uh, natural farming and agroecology, is, is facing a lot of challenges. And in, with this theme of uh, sustainable tourism, whether we and sustainable tourism and natural farming, uh, probably yes, that's one option to take uh, with sustainable. Uh, uh, goals in mind, that's probably one way to go forward. Uh, thank you once again. I know we are short of time. We did want to sing a few lines of a song, but we would restrain ourselves from doing so. Thank you once again for this honor and this belief in uh, uh, that you have put in, uh, because collectives for small and marginal farmers, which is the norm in most mountain communities, is the way forward. And for putting this uh, uh, belief in us and the honor that you've bestowed, it would help us in going forward in a uh, much more uh, resilient manner. Thank you. Thank you, Anita Ji. So uh, on your behalf, uh, a colleague from Isimur is receiving this award and we'll make sure that the award reaches to you soon. Thank you. It's a small cash prize. We'll make sure our colleague Nan doesn't misuse it and get to it. Thank you, Nan. And I'm truly proud to be playing a courier man for this particular award because I, I, have, I have no role to play in that particular great work they do. But I'm aware of and I really admire the work of Umang as well as Dr. Anita Paul. I've heard a lot about them. So I'm really, truly honored that I'm carrying it on behalf of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Umang. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anita Paul and Ms. Indra Rawat. Uh, also a winner of the 2021 Dr. Andrew Shield Memorial Mountain Prize is an organization we have had the privilege of hearing about here in person today, the Community Homestay of Nepal. Uh, yeah. Sustainable and socially responsible tourism development initiative organized through a digital platform, both innovated during the pandemic and also provided direct financial support along with new markets and skill development and networking to help tourism in Nepal, who continued to be hard hit by the pandemic. Congratulations to Ms. Kanchan Shastra and Ms. Ayusha Prasen, who are representing the organization here today. Right. Uh, now, I think we are at the end of the, I don't have any more prizes to hand out, awards to hand out. So I will hand over the floor to Maxim. But before I do that, I would like to thank also you, uh, for being a very, very effective panelist, sharing your experience, thought, and of course, uh, Sonam Aungshu, uh, Michael, uh, and Aisha, Aisha, I think received a prize, so I think congratulations. And uh, let me hand over back to you. Happy International Mountains Day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pema. Uh, we'd also like to uh, call our other Mountain Prize winner to say a few words. And uh, so, yeah, I leave the floor to Ms. Conference.
Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for coming here today and happy International Mountains Day to everyone here. Uh, I am Constant Festa and I'm leading Kosele at uh, Community Homestay Network. And I would like to thank, uh, I would like to start off by thanking Isimod for this uh, prestigious award that they have bestowed upon us. And also congratulations to Umang for the similar award that they got. Um, I would also want to take a moment to thank um, CEO of Nepal Chamber of Pata, Mr. Suri Singh Budal for nominating us for this award. Uh, we would not have received this award if you had not um, seen what we were doing and supported us by nominating us. Um, to, today, the event has been quite insightful because uh, we talk about tourism and we only talk about how people, we can bring the people to the communities and bring the people to the beautiful mountains that Nepal already has. But this COVID was definitely a reminder that it's not always possible to go to the places and to visit the communities ourselves, right? Um, it was also a great reminder that not everyone, even without COVID, could come to the places that we have, come to the Himalayas and all the cultural and social activities that they could experience. So during COVID itself, we started our journey and that is what we are going to, I want to share with you all. Uh, next slide, please. So what exactly is Koseli? Is Koseli is trying to build a platform that brings locally produced goods uh, from the communities all over Nepal to a central point. And we aim to create a product value chain for these products that directly stimulates the local economies. Uh, we provide, uh, we do it by providing technical assistance and skill development. And then we also want to develop market for these products. Um, as we all know that there are so many products all over Nepal that even we residing in Kathmandu are not very much aware of. So we can only imagine what the world outside Nepal can um, know about Nepal through these products, right? So how we started Koseli is um, we started during the pandemic. Um, since co uh, Community Homestay Network uh, works closely with communities that are depending on tourism, it was uh, quite hard hit by the pandemic. So we started um, looking for alternatives that can help, the, that can be a little bit of um, support to the communities. So that's how we thought of how the products from these communities can actually get out and introduce the communities, not just the communities, but it could also be a diversified source of income in a sustainable way for the communities. Um, so we kick started off with the support from booking.com. We won the uh, booking booster grant from booking.com back in July, 2020. So that is how we started. And back then we started with five communities, five communities and they offered 10 different types of products. Uh, one of the communities that we started off uh, included Pisang, a small community in Monang. Well, now Monang is pretty popular with the, um, in the mountain areas with mountaineers and travelers and tourists, right? And like um, all our panelists uh, mentioned before, it's not always possible that we go there and travelers and tourists can come there. So the idea was to bring products from Monang, like from Pro Monang, we especially have beans. So these beans, we want these beans to go beyond just Nepal in the international world as well, where um, those people who can't come directly to Nepal or who can't go to Monang can actually get a taste of what the food out there might be like. And um, like Koseli itself uh, in Nepali, it's not just um, a gift, but it's more like a warm affection that you pass on. So that is the Koseli that we want uh, from the communities to come to the uh, world beyond. Uh, so right now we have 16 products from eight communities. And in the market, we have our outlets at Traditional Comfort, Traditional Stay, Bricks Cafe, and Avatar. And we are also partnering with businesses uh, so that these communities, sorry, these products can have a larger market. And we have partnered with um, Traditional Comfort and Bricks, and we are also partnering with Food Mandu. Uh, and one of our major highlights in this year was receiving the title of Once to Watch. Uh, at the World Responsible Tourism Awards in 2021. Uh, now coming to uh, what have we been able to do in the past uh, one and a half years is uh, in only in 2021 itself, up till 
right now, December is still left. So we were able to have a sales of around uh, 3 lakh Nepali rupees um, from all these communities. And we were able to give skill development trainings to two communities. We were able to support two communities with technical assistance by helping them with um, hygienic packaging procedures and quality standards that they can maintain while packaging. Uh, and also uh, helping them learn more about branding and how much it plays an important role in a business. And uh, one of our highlights is being able to involve 68 local women from all over the communities who are directly involved in the product development phase. And talking about the sustainability aspect, we really want to keep the three pillars of sustainability in our core. So socially, we want, we hope and we aspire that it can help us bring social changes in the communities by empowering the women and having them have a sense of financial independence by, by being involved in this um, smaller entrepreneurial journeys of their own. Uh, well, economically, of course, it is a relief that um, they can be able to get a diversified source of income. And environmentally, what we aim to do is we all know that we um, have been importing a lot of food as well from outside. Well, an example is the boneless fish that we import. So to an alternative to that, we want to create um, local uh, fish and local dog products, which can ultimately help shorter the uh, chain of products being delivered. And in the larger run, it would help uh, to reduce the carbon emissions as well. Um, so that is all about Koseli in short and what we've been able to be in this one and a half years. Um, so you can, uh, you can reach to us uh, through our social media platforms uh, in Facebook and Instagram. And again, thank you everyone for being here and happy International Mountains Day. <laughs>